Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, good, y'all are full from lunch, special lunch today. Um, my name is Joy Fulkerson, it's my honor to serve as President of Staff Senate and just wanna say thanks so much for all of you who are present here in the CUP Auditorium and then all of you who are online. I think we are about to exceed 100 plus folks viewing with us uh, live and for those folks that I know for various reasons are sitting at your desk uh, watching this, as we continue to have town hall forums, I hope that you'll step out and come and be in person as well. This is an opportunity for us to get to know our senior leaders well, to sort of get to know each other as staff and faculty um, as we all sort of work towards our common goal of making ETSU the very best it can be. Just want to recognize a couple of other folks in the room, uh, past president Candy Massey, Anthony Johnson, staff senate vice president, other executive office, officers of staff senate are Chastity Drew, our secretary, David Finney, our treasurer, and Cody Green, member at large. Again, I want to say thanks to Dr. Nolan and his team for taking time out of their busy day to join us. And again, finally, to say thanks to all of you who submitted questions in advance. That allows us to make sure that this time is best served for you. But we will save some time for Q&A here for folks live in the room. So just as you're listening and, and, and learning, um, feel free to jot some questions down for Dr. Nolan as well. Thank you all so much, and Dr. Nolan, thank you, and thanks so much. Uh, congratulations on your 10-year anniversary here at ETSU. We look forward to working with you for several more. Thanks. Well, I guess that determines how we're going to make this run. Um, well, first, thank you all. Thank you for taking the time to be present on this beautiful afternoon. Uh, this is the first in-person town hall that we've held at the university in more than two and a half years. In fact, it was 2019, the last time we had the opportunity to convene in this setting. During the pandemic, we had multiple forums in an online setting, which served the needs of the institution. And today, we're going to do it in a hybrid format with individuals attending both here and present, as well as those joining us online. I want to take a moment to kind of set the stage in terms of the elements that I'm going to discuss. Some of these things I touched upon in the board meeting on Friday, uh, but others are unique to this setting. I want to talk a little bit about enrollment because so much of what moves at this institution is predicated on enrollment and student success. I'm going to talk some about the governor's budget and provide an overview of the legislative session, and then quickly talk some about the committee for 125 but with an accent on the action agenda that's getting ready to move across the campus. The past two years, in, in many respects, have been beyond description. In fact, it seems like just yesterday that it was March of 2020, and we gathered in the lobby out there to cut the ribbon on this building. And then shortly thereafter, we transitioned and pivoted to remote. I think what you'll see as I move through these slides is that the speed at which we transition to that remote environment is going to be matched in some respects with a cadence of purposeful activity moving forward from March on as we as a university begin to implement some of the procedures that were called for in 125 as well as called for by task forces that some of you in the room led pre-pandemic and during pandemic. You all are familiar with a lot of these aspects. These are the challenges that are not only impacting our institution but institutions across the country. I've talked a lot over the course of the past three, four years about the looming demographic cliff. You trace that back to the Great Recession, 2008, decline in birth rates, fewer students moving through the traditional funnel of K-12, then making their way onto post-secondary education. The good news is, is that the steep of the cliff is not going to be as steep as had been anticipated. So that drop of 15% that had been predict predicted is now around 10%. That's nationally here in Tennessee and in the South. The numbers are also not that extreme, but demographic changes are on the horizon. But for all intents and purposes, we experienced the demographic cliff over the course of the past two years with COVID as fewer students went on to post-secondary education. And those students who did go on to post-secondary education had a different set of expectations and in many respects, a different experience than they did beforehand. All of that plays through the way we operate, the way we're structured, and the way we work with students. 
There was a question that came in uh, prior to uh, the town hall around enrollment. I realize those numbers are extremely small. The takeaway is every single institution in the state, minus the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, experienced enrollment declines. The community colleges, many community colleges, saw double digit enrollment declines, and the community college sector as a whole down more than 10,000 students pre to post. That impacts us because that's fewer transfers coming to the institution. But across the board, fewer students moving into post-secondary education. Now let's pull back and look at our region. These are our application data for this fall, this coming 22 class. You can see pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. This was another question that we received prior to the town hall. How has enrollment shifted as a result of the pandemic? Down. How have applications shifted? Our applications are actually up. In fact, we've set a record week now over week at any point in time in the university's history in the number of applications. We'll be north of 10,000 applications for the freshman class by the time the cycle closes, but we're already north of 10,000 applications now. This is a result of the work of the staff. This is a result of the work of Heather Levesque and her team. It's a result of the work of student ambassadors who led tours throughout the pandemic, who led tours on weekends. It's a result of Joe Sherland's staff who set up tents and parking lots outside of high schools. We were the only institution in the state doing in-person visits during the pandemic. That personal touch, that personal feel, then ripples through these numbers. As you see, our applications up across the board, particularly for local high schools. Look at the growth at Dobbins-Bennett from 18 to now. And then you see our feeder counties. We're an institution that relies heavily on Northeast Tennessee to make its enrollment base. But that makes sense. We're an institution that exists to serve the needs of the people of Northeast Tennessee. I want to take a moment to thank Jessica Vaud and her team in marketing communications for their outreach work. We've restructured that unit. We've restructured the operations. We've restructured their approach. And you can see from the moment those changes were made to today, the double visitation rate to the website. So more traffic on ground, more traffic through applications, but also more traffic visiting the website to learn about the institution. All of this is positioning us to have an enrollment rebound, which then impacts our net financial position. I want to take a minute on this slide, and I apologize for the font being small. We'll post all this up on the web when it's done. Um, but look at that bottom chart. What that bottom chart shows you is our retention rate, fall to spring. Look at that drop in our fall to spring retention rate in the middle of the pandemic. Look at the rebound over this past fall to this spring. We're now back on the trend line where we should be as an institution. Why did we make that rebound? Because we're on ground, because we're in person, because our faculty and staff are here to serve our students. We're not an online institution. We were not built to serve students from remote. We're built to serve students in a hands-on environment, one-on-one -on -one settings, building relationships with students. Many of our students are first generation, low income. They come from at-risk backgrounds. They need the opportunity to sit in rooms with our staff and receive direct counseling, direct tutoring, direct relationships. They need to have the opportunity to build those relationships with faculty. My bet is every single one of us is here today, either standing, holding a mic because I broke the mic stand, or sitting listening to me because of a faculty member. My life was changed by a gentleman named Dr. Robert DeClerico. He taught Introduction to American Government at West Virginia University. He spent countless hours with me, helping me find my path academically. All of you have faculty or staff who shaped your life. That doesn't happen online. So I know that there are a lot of questions about work from remote policy, and I'll get to some of those in a little bit. But in order for our institution to meet its mission needs, we've got to be here. We can't do that from a remote posture. And you see that with the rebound in retention rates when we're able to get back on ground. This is our projected graduation rate for the year. Um, we'll know within the next couple of months if this holds. But uh, Dr. Hoff and the work that he's done to model our graduation rate, that 53% is the highest graduation rate in the history of the university. So in the face of a global pandemic, our students persevered. They persevered because of the assistance that we were able to provide. 
but that 53% is start at ETSU, graduate at ETSU, highest in the history of the university. So now let's shift a little bit. Talk some about enrollment because we received questions on enrollment prior to the session. Now let's talk some about some of the questions we received around governor's budget, salary enhancements, and capital construction. Within Governor Lee's budget, which is a historic budget, I've worked in the state's higher education system for two and a half decades. In my career, I've never seen a budget like this budget, both in terms of its investment in staff, salaries, facilities, and financial aid. For the first time in a decade and a half, the governor has called for an increase in the purchasing power of the lottery scholarship, moving that scholarship from its current level of $3,500 to $5,100. The eligibility criteria for the lottery are a 3-0 or a 21 ACT score. About 70% of all high school seniors in the state qualify. So if you look at our undergraduate population, we just made college more affordable for them through the governor's budget. That also allows us as an institution to explore how we package aid to ensure that our aid that we sometimes match with things provided on the state side allow us to push farther from an affordability perspective. There's funding for the outcomes formula and then the point at the bottom around salary. This budget provides a 4% salary pool to expand salaries across the institution. Per tradition, this pool is not 100% fully funded. We as an institution will utilize some of the resources that were afforded in the governor's budget to cover inflationary costs, and we're going to take those resources and use them as a portion of a match to fully fund the salary pool. So for those of you who've worked in higher education for a while, um, I mean, a little inside baseball, as Dr. Bach used to call it, um, the governor usually funds the salary at a 50% level. We as institutions then look to tuition and fee revenues to provide the match. On average, a 1% salary enhancement is a 1% fee enhancement. So if we were holding this year constant to the way we had in the past, you've got a 4% pool, 2% provided by the state, we would raise fees 2%. However, we've committed not to raise tuition and fees for the fall. We've also committed not to raise our housing cost. We're probably the only large scale landlord in the region that's not raising rent. For those of you who rent, I guarantee you, your rent is going up. It's not going to increase at East Tennessee State University for students in the fall. So we gotta to look to efficiencies. We've gotta to look to do more with the resources we have because we'll take those inflationary aspects to match salary. Now that 4% doesn't begin to cover inflation. That 4% does not begin to cover inflation. It also does not begin to cover structural gaps in our salary and compensation levels at the university. We have more than 60 vacancies in grounds, custodial services, et cetera, right now. Vacancies that we've been unable to fill throughout the pandemic. Part of that, I think, is a function of salary. I think part of that is a function of competitive landscape. But part of that is also replicated across the nation. This is not an ETSU issue, it's a national issue. But what we have a responsibility at the university to do is to make our salaries competitive. We've raised our starting salary four times in the past 12 months. And I anticipate as we move through the close of the year, we will raise it on several more occasions. But in order to raise starting salaries, moving them from 12, probably north of 13 and a half, to look at gaps such as lecturers and instructors, which are far below our peer institutions, We've got to look at these salary resources as a pool, not in an across the board manner, so that we can address areas on campus for which there are significant structural deficiencies. And I'm confident we'll get into some of this more in the Q&A perspective. But that is the largest percentage increase of a state salary that we've had in the entire time that I've had the honor to serve as president. So it's a good problem to have. We're investing in people but we recognize the pressures that inflation is putting on all of us, the university included, because everything from our light bill to our gas bill to every capital construction project is becoming more expensive for all of us. As you look at the governor's budget, you're familiar with the aspects on capital. Uh, to put that in context, if you took the sum of every capital project that we've had at this university from when I was in high school to now, it would not add up, up to that dollar amount the single largest investment in capital in the history of the university. And there's only one institution in the state that has three new capital projects. 
Not Knoxville, not Memphis, not Tennessee Tech, but us. The only university in the state of Tennessee with three capital projects. And these are academic buildings. I had the opportunity earlier today to see former student body president who, when he was former student body president, he was asking, what are we going to do with Brown Hall? I had the opportunity to reflect upon conversations with students and faculty over the course of a decade about the need to invest and bring Brown Hall up to speed. That's what this does. It's a two-phase investment. The first phase is $47 million. It'll get half the building. And then we'll come back with the second phase. At that point, that'll probably be about $55 million to completely renovate Brown Hall top to bottom. The academic building will take the university center to the ground and in its place will become a modern multidisciplinary classroom facility that reaches across the full span of the campus. And then the final project allows Dr. Block and his team to build out a health sciences campus behind the innovation lab, a classroom facility and a clinical facility that will allow our students in the health sciences to continue to learn in an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary manner similar to the best practices that exist in Bishop Hall. So those aspects of capital, I cannot understate their importance. 50 years from now, the decisions that you all are gonna be a part of, because you're going to have a chance to be on the programming and design committees, you're going to have a chance to have input on how these buildings look, will continue to impact generation after generation after generation of student at the university. Just kind of move quickly through this, but I, I want to touch here. Banner ERP. Within the governor's budget is $19 million to replace the banner information system. Everything at this institution runs on banner. Payroll, financial aid, enrollment, all runs on banner. And for those of you who work in that platform, you know it's a complicated platform built in an environment in which people wrote hard code. Now we're going to modernize a system that we've been running for almost 20 years, moving to a cloud-based environment. That gives us the opportunity to look top to bottom at processes and streamline aspects of the institution. This is something we needed to do anyway because our banner contract was going to expire and we were going to have to self-fund this. Now that is a $19 million investment in the IT infrastructure of the university. So now let me shift gears and I'll move through some of this quick because I want to get onto some slides and answer questions. And, and I thank you all for, for listening. You know, one of the aspects that I hear time and time again is that at East Tennessee State University we have a communication problem, that we don't do a good enough job of communicating information. And communication is a two-way street. It's both active engagement and active listening. So I thank you all for being active listeners and in a little bit we'll have the active engagement. But as you look through this, this is what comes next with 125. We started talking about the next chapter of 125 in 2020. Members of the senior leadership team went on a strategic retreat in Washington at EAB. We came back from that retreat and COVID hit. So we're a little delayed in the implementation, but that's afforded the additional opportunity for us to really think strategically about the lessons learned from COVID and how we apply those lessons learned to the next chapter of the university. But we're going to have listening sessions, a follow-up town hall on 125, and then all this will go to the board in a couple of short months. I want to spend a little bit of time, not too much on these slides, because this is the, ejac uh, the action agenda that follows. If you look at these bullets, and I'm not going to touch on all of them, but any two or three bullets on their own are an active agenda for a campus we hopefully will be able to move on at least two-thirds of these. We may not realize all of these bullet points over the course of the next four to five years, but if we can realize success on at least two-thirds, we've moved the campus farther down the field. 2,100 students, 60% graduation rate, 80% retention rate. All of the aspects from restructuring advising to student support services to the way we recruit and target and work with students for those of you who are in student affairs and student life, everything you do rolls up in those three bullets. We're gonna completely transform housing. The board meeting on Friday, the board approved $30 million in debt to issue bonds to generate resources to renovate the spine of the campus. Residence halls that haven't been touched since I was in kindergarten. Renovating facilities to bring them up to meet the modern expectations of our students. 
We're going to close our capital campaign, most successful capital campaign in the history of the university, largest gift in the history of the university was part of that campaign. And then we're going to turn around and prepare our next comprehensive facility strategic plan. We're going to work with Huron, an external consulting group, to look at processes, structure, staffing, and efficiencies. Think of how difficult it is to purchase something on this campus. The forms you have to move through, the steps that have to go through from an approval process. How can we streamline that? We've got outstanding new staff working across the business and finance division who are bringing new ideas to the university on how we can streamline operations. Working with Huron, we have an opportunity to look at process, structure, and efficiencies to prepare the institution as we move into the implementation of Oracle. You've got the implementation of our online programming report from Huron, in which you'll see us over the course of the next five years launch a significant number of new online programs, as well as on-ground programs. I've mentioned the ERP on a couple of occasions. We have active searches underway, searches for two college deans, the largest college at the institution, arts and sciences, as well as business and technology. And then Dr. McCorkle is rounding out her staff in the provost office, filling some strategic vacancies in that area. We're going to continue the development of the research corporation, and we're going to deepen our partnership with Ballard. I want to take a moment to touch on the second bullet, because Dr. Bitter is here with us this afternoon. Dr. Bitter led a committee that focused on community engagement. That work occurred in the pandemic hit, but that work set the stage for our QEP, because our QEP is going to be focused on community engagement. How do we take the resources of our students, our faculty, and staff, and make a difference in the lives of the people of this region? This entails service learning. It entails active engagement. But ultimately, what it gives us the opportunity is to learn from the community and the community to learn from us. During the pandemic, we saw college-going rates across the region plummet. In fact, the college-going rates in many of the counties that are within our service area are 10% below where they were pre-pandemic. There are counties in our service region where less than half of the students who graduate from high school go on to college in the fall, less than half. This isn't coming to ETSU. This is a TCAT. This is a community college. It's a public institution or a private institution. If you want to be a welder, what's the path to full-time employment? To become a certified welder. Where do you get certified at a TCAT? That's college enrollment. So how can we as an institution help drive college-going rates, but also to get back to constructive conversations with our community college peers around transfer, articulation, structured pathways, and student success? Conversations that we used to have with frequency when we were under the auspices of the Board of Regents, but we've not had in a while. Continue to deepen our efforts to paint the region blue and gold. And then the final bullet from my perspective is, if not the most important bullet, among the most important bullet. We're not looking at efficiencies to turn around and do other things. We're looking at efficiencies across the board so that we can redirect those savings into salaries. Can't say it any more clearly. Our goal in the first five-year cycle of Committee for 125 work is to take the efficiencies and invest in our people. When I started as president at the institution, the faculty senate at that time reminded me that we had the lowest salaries of our peer institutions. Here we are 10 years later, and we have among the lowest salaries of our peer institutions, even though we provided salary enhancements every single year minus two. So we've got to do something different than across the board. And we also have to remember that over this 10-year time period, our enrollment has shifted. So how do we look at operations? How do we look at structures? And to take those investments and reposition them into our people. So as we come out of COVID, our challenge is to move from aspiration to execution. We've spent two years as a campus, in many respects, trying to survive, trying to keep our families safe, trying to navigate the complexities of COVID. Ladies and gentlemen, COVID's still here. I receive a daily COVID update from Ballard. There are 300 people in the hospital today with COVID. There are more than 70 people in the ICU today with COVID. There are more than 30 people on ventilators today with COVID. And the zero number in the PQ that was so proudly reported a couple days ago, now there's young men and women back 
in the PQ with COVID. Why? Because our region's vaccination rate is under 49%. So I can't stress enough that as much as I want to look past COVID and we are going to move, please do the things you need to do to keep you and your family safe. I know that masks are uncomfortable. We don't have mask mandate. I can't make you wear a mask. I can't make you get vaccinated. But all I can do is beg that you do the things you need to do to keep you and your family safe. Because 95% of all the folks who are in the ICU today at Ballard are there because they didn't get vaccinated. So I'm done with my vaccination advertisement. Let's switch back to East Tennessee State University. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the opportunities that you've afforded to my family and to myself. But I want to thank you for the opportunities that you have afforded to students all across this region. Earlier today, I had the chance to be surprised. And as I said before, I don't like surprises. I kind of like to know what's going on. But it was wonderful today to be in the cave and to see students, to see former students who've realized their life goals and are now back at the institution. That's why we're here. We're not here for buildings. We're not here for initiatives. We're not here to win the Southern Conference Championship next week in Asheville. And we're not Gonzaga. Um, we're here for students. Sometimes I have a tendency to be a little lighthearted and not focused and serious enough. And I want to take this moment to be focused and serious. There's a lot of noise that's happening around this country. There's a lot of noise that's happening in state legislatures around this country. Higher education is being purposefully used as a divisive tool to further political agendas. Don't fall victim to the noise. When I was in graduate school, I studied the works of Marx, Weber, Habermas. I studied critical theory, feminist theory, postmodernist theory, modernist theory. I spent two years studying theory to learn. Our job as faculty members is to create a rich and fertile environment for students to have the opportunity to learn. We're not going to change that. Part of our responsibility as a university is to prepare students for a world beyond our mountains, for a diverse and ever-changing world. That's not going to change. Conversations ebb and flow. Nine years ago, we as a university were terrified of something called MOOCs. I've not thought about MOOCs in a long time. Nine years from now, there'll be another narrative that's playing out across our country about higher education. The current narrative is divisive. The current narrative is concerning. But I assure you that the university will not waver from its commitments to provide opportunities for students to learn everything from bluegrass, mandolin, and banjo all the way to postmodernist theory. So with that, let me step back. I've got a couple questions that have come in before, but you all are present. And part of communication is the opportunity to be actively engaged. And I want to provide the opportunity for individuals who are here today in the Culp Auditorium. If you have questions or concerns, we have a microphone. Please step forward and let's begin the point of conversation. So given that, okay, Joy, go ahead. I was going to say this is our Ferris Bueller moment, so I can go to some of the questions that came in in I'll advance. I'll ask one, and then you okay. can move forward, and other folks, I would, again, welcome questions and comments. Um, you skimmed a little bit over this, and I just want to draw attention because it's personal uh, to me and, and definitely involved in my work, but can you update us on efforts around diversity, equity, and inclusion at the university? So the, the question for, for those watching remote was around the, the university's work in equity, inclusion, and diversity. Um, I, I think if you step back and look at what the institution has done throughout the pandemic, I'm proud of the work that we have been engaged in to build a foundation. We have a rich foundation that has been established through the Mary V. Jordan Multicultural Center. We have a foundation that's been established through the expanded bridge programs that we've implemented during the pandemic. You're going to see speaker series emerge in the months and year to come. We've expanded scholarships. We've got a critical opportunity now with staffing 
We had a member of the university community leave to take an opportunity in Nashville. So we have a vacancy in the multicultural center that we're going to, to advertise and fill. But over the course of, I think, the next month, you will see some major announcements from the university around investments in this space with the potential for the university to be part of a national initiative, a moonshot for equity that I think will take where we are and propel some things forward. Part of our work has been getting things organized properly so that when we do move forward, we have the foundation for action. We've also spent a lot of time listening to students, listening to faculty, listening to staff. I held more than 42 listening sessions last year. So we're, we haven't made the progress that I've wanted to make. It's just like 125. We're a little behind schedule, but we're purposefully behind schedule because I want to make sure that things are organized properly, structured properly, and we've got a foundation so that when we launch these initiatives in the next month, we've got the base to support them. So more to come on that front, but there is a lot that's in the queue. Um, and I want to thank the work of Dr. Keith Johnson and others um, for the work that they have done over the course of the past couple years to serve all students, from international students to Hispanic and Latino students to African American students to students all across the spectrum at the university. Uh, other questions? So maybe let me touch on one or two that came in, and we'll see if anyone wants to step forward. So there was a, a question that came in, many questions that came in around salary, um, but one question that came in particular with respect to the work of ETSU Health and our nurses and healthcare workers who have been on the front line um, fighting against the COVID pandemic for the past two years. And the question states, when will we be in a position to adjust their compensation rates to reflect the work that they've been engaged in, and that many of them feel forgotten and unvalued. Um, it, it pains me to see someone write that they feel forgotten and unvalued for the work that they've done, but I know all of us at certain points because of the pandemic have felt forgotten and unvalued because we've been isolated. We've not had the opportunity to share stories in the hallway to learn about milestone achievements in someone's life. We've not had the opportunity to see our college's children grow up. I see that now that my son has gone back to school, kids who were this tall who are now my height, they changed in an instant. We all missed something. That is gonna be with us for a while. But to the person who sent this in, we are going to make progressive investments particularly in the lowest compensated staff at ETSU Health. I've had conversations with Dr. Block who leads that unit and I know his commitment to impacting those on the bottom end of the work and pay scale. Now, in order to make the investments in ETSU Health, we may have to have some flexibility between main campus and our clinical environment, but let's think about that clinical environment. It has become much more competitive for workers as a result of the changes that Ballot has put in place. Ballot has amplified nurses' salaries. Ballot has amplified salaries for frontline workers. And in order for us to have the outstanding staff and retain the staff that works under Dr. Block's umbrella, we may have to look at some flexibility and staffing. So to whomever put this in, I thank you for the work that you do. I thank you for continuing to serve the people of our region. And if you can just be patient with us, our salaries will go into effect on November 1. But there may be some aspects of salary enhancements that occur prior to November 1, and I anticipate that we'll see some of that work potentially under the auspices of ETSU Health. I've got several questions that have come in around remote work policy. I know that Lori Erickson um, held a town hall within the past couple of weeks, and she fielded a number of questions around our remote work policies. Will they be in effect for the beginning of the next year? The Office of Human Resources is working to develop a policy that should be ready by July 1. And I anticipate that we will see greater flexibility for individuals to work from remote. But we've got to remember that no two jobs on this campus are the same and that we're an on-ground university. So certain areas of the campus are more predisposed to remote work than others. We just had a person who works in my building who announced that they were departing to go work for a university in the Midwest. They're gonna to continue to live here in Northeast Tennessee. 
they're working from remote. But if you work in custodial services, how are you going to work from remote? If you work on the grounds, how are you going to work from remote? If you work in advising and counseling services, there are certain aspects of this campus that have to be here. So will we provide flexibility? Yes. Will there be some units who ask, why do they have more flexibility than my unit? That's going to be asked, yes. But we've got to recognize that we're a broad and diverse campus, and a work from remote policy has to reflect the diversity of positions across the institution. And we've had questions around, here's another question on remote and flex schedules. Um, once again, same answer. We will bring the policy forward. I anticipate July, it may be a little later, but as we move into the fall, we'll have that opportunity for that to have gone through the formal policy process and for there to be a, a little bit more clarity around work from remote and the, the elements that structure it. Um, this is an easy question. Will there be a staff picnic this year? Will it be back in the mini dome? The answer is yes. Um, we'll have the afternoon off as we have in years past. Um, so yes, we will have a staff picnic back on ground, and I know Joy Fulkerson and, and the team at Staff Senate will provide details about that in the days and weeks to come. A um, couple of questions here around daycare. Um, will we put in place daycare options for our faculty and staff? Th this is a, a complicated question. We do have Little Bucks which provides child support services for our students who have children. So the daycare options, the child care options are available at Little Box. There's an absence of daycare facilities across our region. The pandemic has magnified that struggle. Ballard announced last week at their board meeting that they are making significant new investments to expand their infrastructure of child care options. And I look forward to working with Mr. Levine to see if some of those options could be afforded to the faculty and staff at ETSU. We had a subsidized daycare facility at this institution for several decades, and with the pandemic, we consolidated that operation into one service and focused those services on our students. Um, more questions around starting salary. Uh, the question reads, now that the University of Memphis and Knoxville have moved to $15 minimum wage, when does ETSU plan to go to $15? Um, and we t talk about living wages in our region. Um, mentioned this prior, but I'll touch upon it again. We have moved our starting salary four times in a very short period of time. I anticipate it will continue to move upward as we go through the year. Salary is market-based, salary is discipline-based, and salary is dependent upon the work that's provided. Our salaries are not where they need to be, but our salary pool is fixed. If we're able to grow our enrollment, that enrollment growth provides additional resources which allows us to invest in our students and in our faculty and in our staff. The student investment is scholarships, the faculty and staff investments are salaries. So as we grow our enrollment, I anticipate that you will see us make salary investments above and beyond the governor's pool but if we're not able to grow our enrollment, then the governor's pool is the only level of new resource that is made available to the institution to invest in faculty and staff salaries. A question around why is ETSU so, so severely understaffed? Does ETSU plan on matching, once again, the 15-hour rate? Um, I, I don't think the 15-hour pay rate is going to solve our staffing issues. There are private companies all around this region that have moved to $15 and $20 an hour to start, and they still have structural staffing gaps. People have stepped away from employment. We also have to remember that 900,000 Americans died because of COVID. So there are fewer workers, and workers' expectations have changed. So sometimes it's as much about rewards and benefits as it is about salary. So how can we as an institution do a better job of recognizing excellence on our campus, of saying thank you, and then providing benefits? How many of you, and you don't need to raise your hand, but just think, how many of you have a bachelor's, master's, a professional degree because of the tuition benefits afforded by this institution? Many in the room went to school for free because of this institution. How many of you who had children who went here because of the benefits afforded by this institution? 
I don't know of many other employers that have two annual days per month, and I don't know of many other employers that voluntarily gave extra days off as a way to say thank you, recognizing the mental health challenges that we all faced. So are our salaries what they need to be? No. But did any of us go to graduate school to get rich? I'm fortunate to have the position that I have. But I'm also fortunate to be a faculty member. I'd be fortunate to work in student affairs. We're here because we love students. We love the mission. I'm going to see if there's any further questions. We've only got about one left up here. But that action agenda that I showed, if you can't get excited about the things that are on the horizon, new buildings, new academic programs, new initiatives, quality enhancement plan, the opportunity to restructure processes, if you can't get excited about that, you're in the wrong field. And I can't pay you enough to get you excited. You may disagree, but if you go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, one of those theories I learned about in graduate school, all of this is about self-actualization. Dr. Bitter, it's all yours. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, President Nolan, I'd like to just thank you for your leadership and for the development of this university over the last 10 years. Um, I think it's been phenomenal. I've been here 27 years, and the last 10 years have been the best. So thank you very much for that. I also have quibbled from time to time about uh, the, the structure of our COVID response, but it was the best that could be done at this university in this state at this time, and I appreciate all you and the staff did for that too. Now I have three little questions, uh, ranging from really easy to impossible. <laughs> okay, you can take them in whichever order you would like. Okay, well let's do the easy one first. Is there gonna be a festival of ideas this year? Uh, yes, sir. There will be a festival of ideas this year. Uh, the dates are the third week of, fourth week of March, and the speaker series will be announced soon. Um, much of the accent is going to be around the media, and it, it'll be a diverse set. But yes, there will be a festival of ideas, and it's going to run in conjunction uh, with the Civility Week activities on campus. Excellent. So this is going to build off of something Joy asked. And uh, this is a difficult question to ask, probably even more difficult to answer. It's kind of what do we as, as staff, as, as faculty, as students, what's our, what is the, oh, our process? What can be done when we want to protest the legislature? when we want to essentially say laws they're considering or passing are racist and insensitive and just plain crazy. One of which right now is the consideration of a law that would essentially eliminate any teaching of race in the uh, university school and would seep all the way up into my courses in graduate school in courses like social and cultural foundations of counseling. So it's one thing to just go out and protest the world, but when we're really looking directly at state legislatures, the people who control our institution, what would be your guidance on that? Well, I think as, as we look to, I want to hop down, but I also need to take occasional notes, so I'm kind of torn between two elements here. Um, so I, I think as we look at this from a discussion perspective, much of what's needed is a discussion, the opportunity for individuals from different backgrounds and different perspectives to sit and talk, to learn from one another. COVID's taken that away. What we've done is we've shouted at one another through social media. And that has magnified itself into the general assemblies across the country. The things you're hearing here aren't just being heard in Tennessee, they're being heard across the country. More than 25 legislators are looking at pieces of legislation similar to what's being considered in Nashville. I think we have a responsibility to academic quality. 
We have a responsibility to maintain programmatic accreditation. And I'm confident that as we work with our elected officials, that the importance of accreditation will carry weight as this moves through the process. I also remind myself and remind everyone that it's February. We're early in the conversation, and I know that there will be conversations to come. Several pieces of legislation have already moved by the wayside because of conversations that have been occurring. But I also would encourage us to read the legislation in total because certain bills, and I, I can't speak to all, I, I, don't have the, I don't have them memorized, but many of them do afford the opportunity for us to, to look at accreditation, to look at difference. You know, what's being proposed is not what's proposed in other states where they're cutting funding and cutting positions. So I think part of this is a conversation. And as a citizen, you have the opportunity to write letters to the editor, the opportunity to convene gatherings, and the opportunity to correspond with your citizen legislators. So I, I know as we look at the movement that's happening around us, some may say that Nashville is anti-higher education. I, I don't hold that position, because if they were anti-higher education, they wouldn't be investing in salaries, they wouldn't be investing in buildings, they wouldn't be investing in initiatives. I think part of this is just a function of we've lost the ability to talk. You may not agree with the elected officials, but when it's done, if they can understand you and you can understand them, and we can have the backstop of doing nothing that would compromise academic integrity and program accreditation, I think we're making some steps. But I, I don't have an answer to your question. I wish I had a mag magic wand that I could wave. Um, but this just isn't an issue here. It's an issue in half the states across the nation. Your third question's harder than your second? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, imagining that Putin might actually invade the Ukraine, which will cause economic issues all across the world. Are we prepared for another downturn in the economy? I think the answer is, is yes and no. We have the benefit of a little bit of a cushion. CARES has provided us with resources, the predominance of which have gone directly to our students. The bulk of all of the CARES funding that we've pulled down has been passed through payments to our students or resources that we pulled to backfill the losses in housing, residence life, and food service. We still have additional CARES money to, to pull down. And what I would like to do is to put at least $4 million in reserves that takes our reserve position and positions us for a rainy day, because it is going to rain. Um, in many respects, it already is. Gas this summer is going to be north of $5 a gallon. If you look at construction costs, construction costs are 50% higher than they were pre-pandemic. If you look at everything from Milk to vehicles, everything is more expensive. So it's already here. That's why I think the review of process is important. Now let's go back in the middle of COVID, May. What were we doing in May of 20? In May of 20, every single person on this campus was looking at budgets and going through a deep financial review because the governor had told us to prepare for a 15% across the board reduction. Those plans are ready. Now, I hope we don't have to use them. Those plans were not only a 15% reduction in state appropriations, but a reduction in enrollment, because we saw our freshman class drop to 1,676? 1,651. I got the 16-something right. Thank you, Dr. Sherlin. We're talking 2,100 freshmen. So if we can grow enrollment, that balances a reduction in state appropriations, because state only gives us 25 cents on the dollar anyway. But now let's go back to efficiencies. We have more faculty and staff now than we had when we had 15,500 students. 
and we're sitting at 13. Thirteen ninety-two. I made the number up. <laughs> We're sitting at thirteen and change. Twelve hundred fewer students. Three hundred more faculty and staff. So how do we, as we look at efficiencies, as we look at structural gaps, how do we right-size the institution, reinvest those resources in our faculty and staff? If there's a downturn, we're positioned to balance it. If I can put CARES money in reserves, that buys us time. And if we can hit our enrollment goals, the downturn's not going to be as bad as many would expect. I'm hopeful calmer heads will prevail in Eastern Europe, but calmer heads haven't prevailed in Eastern Europe for a thousand years. That was also a theory I learned in graduate school. Is your fourth question harder than your third question? You don't have a fourth question. OK. Other questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I can come down. I'm sorry. I'll meet you halfway. Okay. Thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I probably couldn't have reached that one anyway. OK. Um, so I want to just mention, and this is probably not really a question. It's more of a comment. And it kind of, it's sorry, it's getting back to the salaries. And I do want to preface it by saying that I am, I've been on the annual Day of Giving Committee every year since we started that committee. And I'm a real advocate for giving back to the university. Just ask my colleagues. They get really tired of hearing from me about why everyone who works here should donate to ETSU. And I always give this speech about how, you know, yes, we're not paid as much as we ought to, you know, maybe ought to be, but we have really good, secure jobs. You know, this is the best educational institution in this region. You know, we need to be thankful for what we have and give back to the extent we can. So I, I'm saying that as background. I'm not one of those people that, you know, rolls my eyes and says, oh my gosh, they don't pay us enough. Why are they asking me for money? So I'm not, I'm not one of those, and I do give money. But I do want to point out that I've been here seven years, and because of the increases in starting salaries, I'm now making $675 more than someone who would start at my same level tomorrow. And that is just not right, in my opinion. And I, I don't, I, I know you've definitely acknowledged that that is the case, um, and you may not have a, a more specific answer, but I'm wondering, like, what is being done to right that wrong? And you are right. I mean, inflation's at what, 7.6.9% now? Gas, it's going to probably be up to, you know, beyond that um, percentage of inflation. You know, it's, I'm effectively, we all are, those of us who've been here a while, making less than we were you know, a few years ago. And I understand we have to attract good talent, but we also need to keep the talent that we have. So, again, it's kind of more of a comment. It's, and I don't really expect like an actual, you know, answer so today, let me, but. Let me talk a little bit about process. Um, and I had joked with Dr. Bitter with his fourth question be harder than the third. Your Sorry. question may be harder than Ukraine. Um, <laughs> so, salary. We're in a competitive market for talent. 70% of all of our expenditures are investments in people. 70 cents on every dollar we spend goes towards salaries. If we were to lose a faculty member in, let's say, accounting today, we're going to have to spend six figures to replace that accounting faculty member. And the moment that she walks in the door, she's probably going to make more than multiple faculty in the College of Business who are, have been here for 20 or 30 years. But we're in a nationally competitive market. How do you address that across the board in the snap of a finger? You can't. Earlier this semester, in this building, I had a long-standing custodian come up to me and say, you know, Dr. Nolan, thank you for increasing our starting pay. My salary's gone up a little bit, but the new person who's only been here two weeks makes 75 cents less per hour than I do, and I've been here for a decade and a half. That's not fair. So what we're going to do is we're going to put together a small working group to look at proposals on staff side and a small working group to look at proposals on faculty side to give us options and alternatives beyond across the board. We've done across the board increases almost every year that I've been president, 
with floors and ceilings. So those at the floor receive a larger percentage increase than anyone else. And ceilings are what they are, ceilings, pushing money towards the middle. And it'd be really easy for us this year to, again, have a floor and a ceiling and push money towards the middle. But that's not going to address structural gaps. Our lecturers and instructors on this campus make $12,000 less than the next lowest institution. If we want to attract lecturers and instructors to this institution, we've got to move their salaries up. Grounds and custodial services, electricians, plumbers, skilled trades. The market for folks in the skilled trades is astronomical. We've got to move those salaries up. So what I'd like for us to do in a shared governance manner is put together a multi-year strategy so that that way by the middle of this decade, we've been able to make movements. But within the pressures we have, once again, I only have a 4% pool. Without enrollment growth, we only have a 4% pool. So the only way to grow that pool is through the review of operations and efficiencies to free dollars up to reinvest. So we're going to look at it. It's not just going to be something that springs like Athena from Zeus's head. We will look at this in a deliberate manner, but there are no easy answers to your question. Yes, sir. I think I'll start out with uh, introducing myself. My name is Chance Pritchett. I'm facility maintenance, HVAC, so we work on the heating and cooling and moving water and all that kind of stuff. Um, some compliments. I've been here for three years. Love the institution. Love being here at ETSU. Um, I live five minutes away. I believe campus always looks great. But um, being on a, a facility maintenance side, there's some things that I want to draw attention to. One is the boot voucher. We have a $90 boot voucher. I think it's once annually. Um, we're in mechanical rooms. We're in so many things that um, that just wear our boots out. Your feet are very important when you're in these areas, going up and downstairs all the time too. So I was wondering if we can maybe have an increase on our boot voucher, if that's a possible option to look into. Um, and I think that's really it. Oh yeah, we've been uh, kind of experiencing a little bit of parking issue at the physical plant, physical plant when uh, football players are in. Um, it's been difficult to kind of to get in and maneuver. I didn't know if there was any options to <laughs> fix that or uh, maybe even give the physical plant totally over to the football team and, and allow them to take over the entire space and then maybe set us off or, or something in a different building or a different location off campus or you know off to the side where parking would be more secure for us when we come into work in the mornings and obviously leave and come in on call. Um, so those were my two points that I wanted to bring up. Uh, definitely, like I said, I've been here for three, a little over three years. I absolutely love working for facility maintenance. I love what I do here. Um, Congratulations on 10 years here as well. That'll end that for me. Thank you for your question, Absolutely. and thank you for what you do to make the university move. Appreciate it. You know, as you look at the campus, we take for granted the condition of our institution. We take for granted that the lights come on. We take for granted that the HVAC works. We take for granted the pristine state that most of our buildings are in. Walk our campus and look at the grounds walk our campus and look at the interior state of the buildings, walk our campus and look at the maintenance and upkeep. It's because of you and your team. Do we have buildings that leak? Yes, but we're fixing them. And the governor's making investments to ensure that we can continue to invest in that physical infrastructure. Boot voucher, um, I was asking someone to scribble because I left my notes up here. Um, how many pairs of boots do you need a year? Okay, I, l l let me talk to staff, um, but I'm fairly confident that that's one where we can can make some adjustments. Even an increase. It, Let, 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 
Let me talk to staff, and I, I'm fairly confident we'll be able to do some things there. With res respect to football players and parking, um, I'll, I'll be happy to talk to Coach. You know, the, it, it's, the, the challenge is, is from a cost savings perspective, we made better use of that building rather than building a standalone facilities entity. Right. Um, but parking on this campus, because that was one of the questions, so I don't have to run up and get it. There was a question around accessibility and handicap parking. Handicap accessibility on this campus is going to be further magnified from a challenge perspective as we begin new construction. So Mr. Ross and his team are looking at options that could allow us through shuttles or golf carts to get individuals from an assigned space right into the middle of campus and then pick them up and take them back to their car. I also did something the other day. I walked around and looked at the number of assigned spots. Um, we've got all kinds of assigned, this spot's reserved for this person, this spot's reserved for this person. We've got lots of assigned spots, sometimes in really critical positions. I know for three years I gave my spot up and gave it to Dr. Bach so that that was one less handicap spot that went away at this institution. So we're going to look creatively at parking. But to the person who asked me a question, you know, are we going to build another garage because we have a parking problem? We had enough parking spots for 15,500 students. We have more than enough parking spots for 14,000 students. We have a walking problem, not a parking problem. But for those with accessibility issues, we have an accessibility issue that we are going to address. Um, so I'll, I'll put that one on the list of things to look at as we look at parking. We have a question that's come in. No, you want to wrap up, and then I have some announcements. I'm, we're at time. We're over well, time. The, the, you know, we don't have any clocks. I told Dr. Sherlin <laughs> to take them down because they never work. Um, so I don't know what time it is. It so is. If, it you're, is if probably you're giving me time. the hook, it's. But I want. I don't want to cut you off because I truly appreciate the time, and and I know our staff do as well. So let me say, say thank you. And you know, one of the questions that came through was a question around what can the university do to be more robust in recognizing excellence. And I'd welcome thoughts from individuals in the room around things we can do to recognize excellence. I see excellence on this campus every day. I see excellence in the staff member who sees a piece of trash and stops to pick it up and put it in a trash can. I see excellence in the individuals upstairs at Sodexo and Food Service who continue to keep this campus moving in a pandemic you never saw pictures on the web about the quality of food here because of the work that the staff upstairs did. Likewise for housing and residence life. I see excellence at ETSU Health. First stand-up testing center here. COVID clinics, vaccines here. ETSU Health under Dr. Block's leadership, more than 5,000 people were vaccinated. So I may not do a good enough job of saying thank you, and this is my attempt to say thank you. As I was in the cave, and I saw those pictures of my son, and I see my son now, you've changed my life. I've known some of you from the moment that I was hired. I've had the opportunity to hire a lot of folks in this room. You've changed my life. But you've also changed the life of the 20,000 students who graduated from this university during the time period that I've had the honor to work with you. So do we make as much as we want to? No. Are we able to park where we want to? No. Can we solve all the problems in Nashville? No. But what have we built here? We've built a place that combated COVID better than any other university in the state of Tennessee. On our worst day, we had 70 people in quarantine. Other institutions on their worst day had thousands of people in quarantine. We've built a place where we're investing in equity and inclusion. We've built a place where we're investing in our community. We've built a place that's a little bit different. This region's always been different, the state of Franklin. But you're what make it special. It's been my honor to work with you for a decade. Not going anywhere, so this isn't, he's walking out the door. I don't like celebrations. I don't like anything to be about me. There's no pictures of me, none. You put a picture of me when you run me off or when I die, which I might do because I drink too much Diet Coke. 
and attempt to be lighthearted. But find the humor in your day. Find the joy in your day. And if there's a day that's long, walk to this building. Just talk to a random student. You'll walk back to your office with a smile on your face because that student is here to realize their dreams. Thank you for allowing my family and I to realize our dreams for the past decade. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Nolan. Again, just want to say thanks to all of you that are watching online and are here in the room, and particularly thanks for all of your questions. Thank you for coming and sharing on behalf of yourself and colleagues. Just a couple of announcements. We will continue to do some town halls, and so look for an announcement to come out in the next week or so regarding a 125 town hall. Um, April 21st, Dr. Nolan has blessed us to be able to get out as staff and um, help keep ETSU beautiful. It is a beautiful campus. We are, we are privileged to work on a, in a wonderful space and we want to gather together to do that. April 21st, we'll get some information about that. Staff, uh, last, guest, last staff gathering of the semester will be our traditional uh, staff picnic on May 17th. And so you'll see some dates. And then Dr. Nolan mentioned the Festival of Ideas the last week of March, March 28th through April 4th. Um, excited about that rolling out as well. So lots of opportunities to engage on campus. I would encourage you to do that. Um, as he is working on putting uh, working groups together, as we're looking forward, um, Staff Senate would like to hear from you. So feel free to email us any of your ideas about how we could be better um, efficient and effective and utilize the resources at our disposal. Thank you all so much for coming. Have a great day.